Welcome to Osaradok Ukrainian Cultural and Educational Center. Vitaimo vas usikh to Osaradok. My name is Alenka, and I want to welcome you to our Vishavanka Day Lecture Series. Shchira dyakimo vas usikh shorvi znami svetkuje pre den Vishavanka. Osaradok is dedicated to being a forum for Ukrainian culture and education in our community. We're excited for the opportunity to share Vishavanka Day with you online through active and engaged scholarship. In this video, Larissa Sambanyuk Chaladin will be presenting her lecture, A Stitched Narrative, The History of Ukrainian Embroidery in Canada. Larissa views her life through the lens of an artist. She completed her BFA in Art and Design from the University of Alberta in 1981 and has enjoyed a successful career as a painter and illustrator for over 30 years. Larissa is well known for her watercolor paintings, children book illustrations, and digital animations that have garnered national and international acclaim. She has taught illustration at the King's University and can often be found in schools as an artist in residence. In 2016, Larissa completed her MA in Ukrainian folklore. Her focus was on Ukrainian material culture, particularly embroidery. Her thesis was inspired by the pioneer artisans who created Ukrainian Canadian uh, embroidered pillows. It led to an exhibition of Embroidered Memories, a touring exhibit. Larissa is now working on her PhD in Media and Cultural Studies at the University of Alberta. Her research focuses on how ethnic identity was visualized in Ukrainian Canadian comics, specifically those created by Winnipeg artist Jacob Maidanek during the interwar period. Hi, my name is Larissa Tsimbaduk Chaladin. Many of you know me as the artist who creates paintings inspired by my Ukrainian heritage. Pieces such as After the Hopak and collections titled Flowers of the Bible, Baba's Garden, and Celebrating Women are some of my more popular works. In 2013, I became interested in how early Canadian pioneers creatively expressed themselves. What inspired them? What did they, what and when did they find time to do it? And what materials did they work with? My curiosity led me to the University of Alberta, where I applied my research towards the completion of a master's degree in Ukrainian folklore. What I found was that one of the most popular means of creative expression among early Ukrainian Canadian settlers was through textiles and embroidery. My thesis focused specifically on Ukrainian Canadian embroidered pillows. As I explored the topic, I found that there was very little written about the history of Ukrainian embroidery in Canada, so I became motivated to record what I found. Many of us hold in our cultural consciousness a deep association to the textiles and fibers of our lives. In fact, our language is full of expressions that indicate how central textiles are to our collective consciousness. For example, we use fiber terms to express the essential stuff that, there are, that we are made of, like life cord, where life hangs by a thread, or we are said to be defined by our moral fiber. And the birth of our universe is often seen as a vibrating filament of energy, as physicists speak of matter coming into existence as string theory. Many of the world's esoteric concepts are also symbolically explained with textile metaphor. In the West, biblical uh, textile metaphor reminds us that all is impermanent and there is a time to rend and a time to sow. We can hear how textiles give us social metaphor as we speak of people's lives as being interwoven in a social fabric or entwined with one another. Textile expressions also evoke emotions and we can be cloaked in fear or clothed in darkness. We also speak of spinning a yarn when we draw out words and put them together to tell a tale and we put a spin on ideas or events shaping them as we would like them to be and people who dabble in magic weave spells. Making cloth is almost universally considered akin to making life and thread is often understood as a pathway or a line to follow. A string tied around a finger serves as a memory trigger and in ancient Greek myth, uh, Theseus followed a thread out of the impossible labyrinth. And for most of us, the internet serves as an infinitely expanding collective web that affects us almost daily 
Today, we follow threads in online conversations as our discussions weave in and out of each other. Another aspect of understanding the meaning of textiles is by looking at how they are connected to our mortal journey. Our textiles are, off, are in, involved in the many rites of passage from the moment we are born and swaddled in a receiving blanket to the head coverings incorporated into coming of age rituals, the true souls of diary textiles, wedding rituals such as the bonding of hands with a lushnek, graduations, and in death, depending on the culture we identify with, we may be simply wrapped or covered with a cloth or dressed in the finest of clothes. Therefore, with our language and metaphors and our myths and rituals so closely tied to textiles, it is no surprise that our own identities are defined by the clothing we wear and the meanings and memories of our cultural heritage that are defined by textiles surround us. Embroidery is one of the ways that we extend the symbolic nature of a piece of cloth beyond the materialistic meaning with embroidery. The cloth becomes not only physically functional, when embellished with designs and colors, the cloth further narrates the story of our lives and can embody our cultural memories and define our identity. Ukrainian embroidery has a very colorful history and plays a large role in Ukrainian customs and traditions. I found that the items themselves, as well as the patterns and motifs that adorn them, are part of the Ukrainian identity in both Ukraine as well as in the diaspora. In the past, embroidery defined the village, the family, and the individual. For example, dyes were made from plants and minerals in a specific area, usually close to home. Therefore, the colors of dyed embroidery threads were determined by what was found close by and thereby identified the area uh, where you were from. Or if you were living on a trade route, you could obtain a supply of exotic colors or gold thread, which again acknowledged where you were from. Likewise, patterns were inspired by the flora and fauna from the nearby environment. For example, poppies or bachelor buttons. Or a pattern may also take reference from a legend that would spark an idea or a motif such as stars in the heavens or a ram as a symbol of strength would be embroidered onto a piece of cloth. As a result, a micro environment such as the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains would produce different colors and motifs than those found on the steppes of Ukraine. Today we use those embroidery patterns and colors to help us define the regions of Ukraine. These regional variations in embroidery cor correspond to the cultural and political boundaries that we now see on maps. Ukrainian embroidery in Canada evolved from these basic regional beginnings. Historically, it was Sir Clifford Sifton, Minister of the Interior under Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier, who was responsible for encouraging the massive amount of immigration to Canada, which occurred during the first decade of the 20th century. Sifton targeted Eastern and Western Europeans, as well as Scandinavians and rural communities in the United Kingdom. Each group came with their own folklore and customs, as well as material culture that was unique to their community. That is to say that they each came with their own textile and embroidery variations, including the Bukovinians and Galicians, who came from what is now Western Ukraine. Ukrainians immigrated to Canada in five waves. Each wave ha had a significant impact on the textiles and visual identity of the Ukrainian Canadians. The first three had the biggest impact. The first wave arrived between 1891 and the First World War. The immigrants were predominantly peasants from farming communities in Western Ukraine, and many were illiterate with little formal education. They chose to move to Canada and were primarily motivated by promises of economic freedom. Past research, research and memoirs suggested that many made the journey with literally only the clothes on their backs and a trunk full of essential supplies. Families usually brought very little embroidered linens or extra textiles that were decorative, unless their primary purpose was functional or religious. For example, the colorful poems were 
pretty tapestries, but also served as insulation on walls. Nalavnikya were long woven runners that covered benches, and the intricately embroidered rushnikya ritual towels were used to drape icons and played a role in the wedding ceremony. Otherwise, not much more than a couple of embroidered blouses in the family made their way across the ocean. One of my research participants, 96-year-old Katie from Saskatoon, shared a memory of her mother complaining of not even having room for her diary. Her embroidered pillows and rushnikya were all left behind. Also, after a journey that, that for some families lasted several months, wearing the same clothes, um, even if they were beautifully embroidered, it was not unusual for them to literally shed the past and start a new life by removing their travel clothes and donning Western clothing as soon as they could, just to wear something clean. Both of these images are of typical Ukrainian couples that arrived in Alberta in 1902. They settled um, around 100 kilometers or miles northwest of Edmonton. The photos were taken within a few years of their arrival. The clothing they are wearing is characteristic of those worn by immigrants that traveled from Western Ukraine during that era. Of note is the sheep, sheep sorry, of note is the sheepskin coat that was worn by both men and women and the embroidered blouses. Shortly after arrival, these items were often stored away and replaced by practical clothing, more conducive to farming and less identifiably Ukrainian. Men quickly embraced the business suit and women, once they had time or funds to purchase new material, exchanged their elaborately embroidered pieces for simple garments that were more appropriate for the physical activities of rural farm life or domestic life in the city. This photo, although it's marked 1934, I feel is still a fairly accurate visual representation of the simple clothing worn daily by many rural Albertans between 1900 and the 1930s. It reminds me of Alice, who was born on the Canadian prairies in 1918. She put things into perspective for me. Apparently, her mother often said, if it wasn't on your back when you came, you lived without it. Alice continued to explain, and I quote, my mother raised 11 kids and she grew 300 heads of cabbage every year. She had no time to sew, let alone embroider. The statement emphasizes that initially the textiles of that time were fabrics of necessity, primarily made of cloth um, for a growing family. Basics cons uh, consisted of hand woven hemp, hemp, sorry, they were of hand woven hemp and linen, supplemented by the reuse of flour and sugar sacks, and some bought fabric when funds were available. Due to the lack of funds and lack of time, very few items were decorated. Nevertheless, many families, as in the Austin Chucks, did bring out their decorative clothing from the homeland on special occasions, especially the female attire. This is an example of the Sunday best that was worn by first wave immigrants when attend attending church, weddings, funerals, and other gatherings. However, my friend Alice also noted that it was her mother and older sisters that got to wear the old blouses. Not many, uh, or not many um, or had, or had the opportunity to wear embroidered clothing because it, there wasn't time to create it for the next generation to wear. Alice told me that, and I quote again, if you wanted something pretty, you had to make it yourself, adding that her mom hadn't had time to show her how to embroider or sew. Alice, in her own words, said, I just made it up, elaborating that she and her sisters most frequently just copied or modified contemporary clothing styles out of the Eaton's catalog. The bulk of the first wave of Ukrainian immigrants to Canada settled on the prairies in rural areas. When women did get an opportunity to embroider, it was challenging to create what we would refer to as authentic Ukrainian designs. This was mainly because they were now isolated from their homeland. There was a physical disconnect. Living in Canada meant that they had very little visual reference that was specifically Ukrainian. Also, 
the majority of the young women were very young when they immigrated, in their late teens and early 20s. They were essentially inexperienced compared to their mothers and grandmothers that were left behind. The young new Canadians had a limited cultural needlework vocabulary. They would have to create from memory or take inspiration from what they found around them and, like Alice said, make it up. So I've argued, although there are some examples from the pioneer era of Ukrainian embroidery housed in North American museums, compared to the homeland environments that the pioneers left behind in Ukraine, there are very few items that the new generation of Ukrainian Canadians could use as embroidery examples. Ukrainian embroidery in Canada during the early 20s was actually quite scarce in the community. There are over 20 embroidery stitches associated with regional traditions in Ukraine. The four most common stitches found on Ukrainian items of the early 1900s are cross stitch, nizinka, which is similar to black work, yavoryoka, which is a type of satin stitch, and merashka, or hard anchor, which is where you embroider and cut out uh, to make little uh, lace-like patterns. There are also examples of beadwork on blouses from this era. The oldest blouses created in Ukraine exhibit the greatest variety of stitches. When it comes to actual embroidery and woven patterns applied to the garments, I have found that the decorative patterns on folk dress from Ukraine bear a connection to the villages that they came from. Therefore, the village of origin of many first pioneers could be identified by the stitches as well as embroidery and woven patterns on garments and linens that they brought with them. In contrast, I found that the patterns and stitches on pieces newly created in Canada were modified, innovative. They were interpretations of heritage patterns influenced by the multicultural community in which they were now living. As a result, examples created in Canada during this first era, you'll find innovative designs suggesting cross-cultural sharing of patterns, colors, and techniques. The blending of patterns occurred on two levels. First, Many items embroidered in Canada mixed the different patterns and colors that were used to define the specific regions of Ukraine. So you found a little bit of a Hutzel pattern of colors mixed with a, a pattern that was more com common from a different area, as, like central Ukraine, simply because they weren't sure which ones went together. There was also a sharing between the cultural groups now living and working together in the same community. And quite often you will find um, from, from the early era, something that looks Ukrainian and then embellished with a pattern that might have been from um, an English uh, piece of embroidery. During my research, I photographed over 500 different Canadian-made Ukrainian embroidered pillows. Approximately 86 were from this era, of which 80 were each unique onto themselves. There is an identifiable Ukrainian component, but regional connections were blurred and a new Canadian multicultural interpretation was evolving. The second wave of Ukrainians arrived in Canada during the interwar years between World War I and World War II. Compared to the first wave, this population was more educated and came from urban centres. Their sphere of experience included Western European influences in clothing and home decor. The second wave brought with them a new flavor of Ukrainian aesthetics. This era in Ukrainian textiles in Western Canada was molded by several influential individuals, notably Savela Stachishin. At the young age of 11, Savela came to Canada with her parents. They settled on a farm in Saskatchewan, but Savela was quickly moved to the city of Saskatoon to complete her high school education. She lived at Mohela Institute, a Ukrainian student's residence on the University of Saskatchewan campus, and enamored with student life, she continued learning, becoming the first Canadian of Ukrainian descent to graduate with a degree in home economics. A passion for a Ukrainian heritage, coupled with the credibility of a university degree, Stacheshin worked as a provincial home economist by day, teaching rural Canadian women practical domestic skills and by night, she held community classes teaching the intricacies of Ukrainian needlework. Between 1925 and 1939, Stichesian was also the Canadian representative for the Ukrainian women's magazine, Nova Khata, 
Published in Nibio, this periodical featured fashion and home decor and the contributors were young Ukrainian designers who had graduated from schools in Paris and Prague. Stichetian took every opportunity to sell subscriptions to the magazine to Ukrainian communities all across Canada from Montreal to Vancouver. Because of this initiative, Stichetian brought new contemporary Ukrainian fashions, needlework, patterns and home decor ideas into Canadian homes. At this time, uh, the English language news magazines such as Chatelaine and Good Housekeeping began to feature folk art projects, including embroidered pillows and Ukrainian embroidery, making it socially acceptable to create and wear heritage clothing. There was an easing in the pressure to assimilate. During the late 1920s and 30s, Stichetian was also instrumental in facilitating the Canadian Pacific Railway Arts and Crafts ex Expositions that were held in Toronto, Winnipeg, Saskatoon, and Calgary. She also wrote Mistetsky Skarbe Ukrainski Vyshevok, the first Ukrainian embroidery book published in Canada. When studying her legacy, you could almost say that Stichetian was on a mission to raise the standard of needlework from peasantry to high art. As a founding member of the Ukrainian Women's Association of Canada, Stichetian frequently traveled between Saskatoon and Edmonton. She inspired embroidery classes across the prairies and initiated the collection of textiles from the first wave that had been abandoned by the early pioneers. Stichetian used this collection to collaborate with the local embroidery guild to hold exhibits at the Saskatoon Art Gallery and ultimately to establish the Ukrainian Museum of Canada with branches in Saskatoon, Edmonton, Calgary, Winnipeg and Toronto. Another factor to take into consideration when looking at the embroidery of the first, first two waves of Ukrainian immigrants is the textile supplies. During the early immigration era, Textile supplies, including thread, cloth, and dyes, were limited by the time available to create them. They did, however, first continue with the tradition from Ukraine. Most fabric was handwoven hemp, hemp and linen made from flax. Suppl they supplemented it with repur repurposed flour and sugar sacks, and hemp and linen threads were colored using natural dyes. However, unlike in Ukraine, in Canada, the use of these fibers to create decorative household linen and clothing ended abruptly in the late 1930s. Due to the late contamination caused by the retting process to make linen, provincial rules prohibited the production of linen, and all across North America, hemp became illegal. Sales of Ada cloth, as a result, they surged. DMC and Anchor brand threads also began to compete for market share around the world and advertising these products was conspicu conspicuously placed in Ukrainian language publications all across Canada. The notion of hand dyeing threads and homemade cloth became obsolete. Stichetian also facilitated the distribution and familiarization of these new materials, the Ada cloth, the DMC, the anchor threads. Um, she distributed them among the rural and Ukrainian community um, by creating patterns that featured these materials and hosting embroidery competitions during the 1930s through the 40s and 50s, and finally retiring from judging embroidery competitions sometime in the mid-1960s. Another early influence on Ukrainian embroidery in Canada was the establishment of Ukrainian dance schools in Canada. During the interwar years, the music, choreography, and particularly the costuming associated with Ukrainian dance became the cornerstone of Ukrainian-Canadian visual identity. Beginning in 1927, a troubadour from Ukraine by the name of Vasyl Avramenko organized Ukrainian dance schools in both rural and urban communities. The performances became a new opportunity to pull out old clothing from the past. This photo is typical of the era. Aside from the homemade wreaths on the girls' heads, most of the dance 
students are wearing the clothing of their parents and grandparents. A mismatch of regional costuming was repurposed for the stage, inspiring a renewed pride in ethnic heritage and subsequently a new respect for the old garments from the past. The third wave of immigration occurred after World War II. The cultural experiences of these Ukrainians were very different from those of previous immigrants and the growing population of Ukrainian Canadians born in Canada. Many of the third wave immigrants had been active participants in wartime conflict and arrived in Canada via dis displaced persons camps in Germany, France and England. This, their sense of fashion and style reflected European influences. These differences made an impact on the community that again altered Ukrainian textiles in Canada. In Winnipeg, Tatyana Korshitz began to collect embroidered pieces that were being shipped to Canada from the displaced persons camps. Many that were fleeing Ukraine had experienced cultural persecution and they feared for the loss of Ukrainian heritage. They were motivated to preserve their material culture and sent samples of embroidery to Osaradok in Winnipeg where they could, would be saved. Mrs. Korshitz accepted over 100 pieces into the Osaradok collection. Her notes detailed uh, descriptions including fibers, the stitches, symbolism, and the regional origin of each item. It is important to note that post-World War II Ukrainian immigrants brought with them a new stage aesthetic that also influenced embroidery in Canada. This photo is one example I have drawn from the Bogdan Mivitsky Ukrainian Folklore Archives at the University of Alberta. It is of performance attire for a choir and Ukrainian dance group in 1945 in a German displaced persons camp. From archive photos and documents like this, we know that the, the costumes were made specifically for the stage. The costumes were thematic, not a random wardrobe that had been cobbled together as in earlier Canadian productions. The, there are several cases where these new immigrants to Canada enforced the same expectations in their new home communities, raising the bar and influencing the evolution of Ukrainian Canadian stage costume to the elaborate garments worn on stage today. When it came to clothing design and home decor, many of the post-World War II immigrants came with portfolios of contemporary embroidery and weaving patterns. There are also accounts of, of a strong nationalistic energy that appeared with the arrival of the third wave that focused on the promotion of Ukrainian authenticity in language, literature, and the arts. This led to a new interest in community arts and crafts classes. Following World War II, embroidery classes sprang up in city and country church basements and community halls. The catalyst for this renewed interest varied. Some of the new immigrants looked upon Canadian-made Ukrainian textiles as being inferior and inaccurate representations of Ukrainian heritage, and they felt that Canadians needed to be taught the correct form. Other new immigrants entered the Canadian communities and felt that the generation gap had resulted in a loss of technical skills. They uh, shared and, and new stitches, feeling that they had to be relearned. Everybody was relying on cross stitch and uh, was 90% at that time um, is what people were doing. And there were still others that were simply motivated to share their skills with the Canadians uh, and other like-minded needlework enthusiasts. The embroidery classes were very popular, producing an amazing amount of artifacts during the 1960s. Craft sales and fashion shows became the major church and community fundraisers during this era, predating the now popular Perohea suppers. Fashion shows became the venue to show off needlework prowess and the projects created in the embroidery classes. Evening gowns, grad dresses, and fashion accessories were adorned with patterns that displayed newly learned Ukrainian embroidery stitches and motifs.
Fashion shows were a place to display needlework proficiency. Models on the runway had replaced embroidery uh, on pillows in the living room, and these garments were very important to the history of Ukrainian textiles in Canada. In conclusion to this short presentation, I would like to bring attention to a painting I created titled An Ensemble of Colour. As mentioned earlier, Ukrainian dance costuming has become the cornerstone of Ukrainian visual identity. The costumes were bright, colourful, flashy and flowing, and represented the many regions of Ukraine. If you have ever watched the dance finale known as the Hopak, you will know what I'm talking about. An Ensemble of Colour is a painting I created in 2011. It represents 40 years of wardrobe history as worn by Edmonton's Chetomosh Ukrainian dancers. The painting is a chronological record of the kind of textiles that were worn on stage in Canada by many of our major Ukrainian dance groups, beginning with inaugural concerts where many dancers wore their grandmother's Sunday best. Through several, you'll find that the painting then follows through several decades of hand embroidered, personally owned wardrobe pieces, which was not unusual in the dance groups in Canada. And then about 20 years ago, they then uh, followed a new trend to have machine made embroidered uh, costuming that were bulk ordered from Ukraine. These costumes were a representation of Ukrainian garments from the past. The collection is a study in itself, exemplifying how Ukrainian embroidery came to Canada initially as a means of making something pretty, an artistic expression that was a handmade piece to enhance personal identity and home decor. However, over time, embroidery has now become a community statement of cultural identity and a declaration of solidarity among all those who identify as Ukrainians or support Ukrainians in Canada and abroad. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for the opportunity to share what I've learned about the history of Ukrainian embroidery in Canada.